Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, July uh, virtual event, event of IIBA Australia. I am Naim Mahmood. I'm the signature of IIBA. And I'm very excited today uh, because of the number of responses we have received regarding this event. We have already more than 120 people joined online and the number is keep on increasing. And uh, for this event, we have more than 315 people registered for it. So I'm assuming that more people will be joining in the next couple of minutes. So if I could please ask you to say hello in the chat box and let us know which city you are from while uh, we wait a couple of minutes uh, for others to join as well. can see Adil. Welcome, Adil. Adil has joined. Amanda joined. Welcome, Amanda. I can see Debra joined. Dawn joined. Welcome, everyone. More and more people are joining online. So welcome everyone. Helen joined. Patrick Simpson. Steph, Sudhir. Hello Sudhir, good to see you. Hello Trina. Trina is our marketing volunteer from Sydney. Hello Trina. and the number of people who are joining, it's keep on increasing. Thank you everyone, uh, thanks for joining today. I think we have um, a lot of people already online, so let's start the session. Just uh, want to start the session with the acknowledgement of country. IBA Australia chapter acknowledged the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognized their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. We pay our respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. So we have a lot of uh, people who are not a member actually joining today. I just want to tell you a little bit about IBA Australia. So IBA Australia is a not-for-profit organization. It's a professional organization who works for the business analysis community. And if you want to know a little bit more about us, uh, feel free to go to the australia.iba.org website. Uh, you'll get a chance to know a little bit more about us, what we do, what are the activities we do in the market, and a lot more information. If you want to become a member or if you want to know a little bit more about our membership benefit, go to the join now link or the chapter, mem chapter membership uh, icon and it will tell you the benefit you can get as a IBA global member and also an IBA Australia chapter member. If you're not receiving email from us and if you want to make sure that you're part of our email list, please feel free to click on the bottom right hand side corner join our email list and uh, it will uh, make sure that we can reach out to you every time we send you an email. So in IBA Australia, we do a lot of things and um, we do events, we do virtual events, we do face-to-face -face events, we do networking events, we do business analysis professional day. We do mentoring program as well for uh, young BAs. And another core cool thing we do is study groups. We ran quite a few study groups this year. And these are some of the study groups are currently in progress in different cities. But what is more important is what are the study groups you can join in, uh, in rest of the years. So you will notice that we are doing a lot more agile study group this year. So whether you want to know more about the Babook or the agile extension of uh, Babook, please feel free to come and join us. 
And I'm very excited to announce that we are also start a data analytics study group uh, later this month. This particular study group will be focused for uh, the people who want to become a facilitator of data analytics study groups in future. So if you are a facilitator of uh, IB Australia or want to facilitate a data analytics study group, keep an eye on this. We will run a session for the facilitator first and then we'll start offering uh, data analytics study groups in all major cities. Now, the good thing is all the study groups are being run virtually at this moment. So regardless, wherever you are in Australia, you can actually join any of these study groups. You don't have to be part of that particular city. So please take advantage of it. And, uh, and we have people literally across Australia joining to different study groups. And it's really a good offer for those who live in regional space where we don't have a face-to-face -face study groups or those who find it difficult actually to come and attend a face-to-face -face study group. So please take advantage of these virtual study groups. If you want to know more, the different events that we run, uh, please go to our website and click on the events link and you'll find out what are the events that's happening um, and including the study groups as well. So you can register from there. For example, we have an event on uh, focusing on uh, it's uh, facilitating in virtual environment on 15th of July. We have another event happening on 29th of July, uh, focusing on the value. So please feel free to go to our website, click on this link and register for the events uh, that we will organize this month. If you want to contact us, uh, click on the about us and, and the contact us link. You'll find the email address uh, of different people who are looking after different portfolio within IBA. For example, if you want to reach out to me, email me on sydneychair at australia.iba.org. On this, on this page, you'll have email address of all the people who can provide you this information you require on study group, mentoring program, events, capability development, corporate engagement, and anything you want to talk about. Uh, just uh, feel free to reach out to us and we'll get back to you. Now, just uh, before starting today's session, I want to bring your attention on a couple of things. The first one is the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any question that you want to ask to today's presenter, please put your question there. And I'll encourage everyone, if you like the question, to click on the like button. We will prioritize the question which has most like uh, while we are asking the question to our presenter. Again, uh, there is a option which is called chat at the bottom right hand side corner if you want to just uh, have a discussion or if you have a question for us uh, the iib volunteers or if you have any comment please feel free to put it there uh, one of our volunteer will monitor the chat box and respond to you as required so any general discussion in chat uh, anything you want to ask to today's presenter will has to be in q a and we have a special surprise for you we have a gift for the person who will, uh, whose question will get the most amount of like. So feel free to like. Uh, Phil Slade is running a virtual event, uh, one more virtual event mid-July. And the person who will, whose question will get the most amount of link, uh, will uh, give a free ticket uh, to that virtual event to that person. So please uh, take advantage of the Q&A session. Now, without further delay, I want to introduce Phil. I'm very excited to have Phil here. Phil was um, one, is our keynote speaker for Brisbane BAPD last year, and uh, everyone loved him, and that's why we wanted to have him back. And uh, let us know a little bit more about how we can influence, uh, especially in this environment where we are all working remotely. So ability to influence uh, our stakeholders and get the best value out of them is more important than ever. Phil is the founder of Decedia. Uh, he's also a psychologist and a behavioral economist. So without further delay, I want to hand it over to Phil. And uh, Phil, uh, to you, cannot hear you, Phil. You're on mute. There's a, there's a funny thing called the mute button, which apparently uh, helps when you're trying to talk to somebody. So. Uh, found the mute button where all systems go. 
that name. That's a, that's a great introduction. Great to be here. Um, so I think we're, we're kicking on straight away. So yes, I am, my name is Phil Slade. Uh, I am the co-founder of Decider. Uh, we're a company that's uh, been uh, based and founded uh, with, the, with the intention to help people uh, make better decisions. So uh, our founding sort of philosophy or our vision is, is to increase the decision-making uh, competency of people around the world. And by doing that, uh, we'll actually solve most of the psychological, um, social, political, environmental issues that we find today simply by people making small individual better decisions. And part of that is about us not only making better decisions for ourselves, but it's also influencing other people around us to, to make good decisions. And this whole idea of influence uh, is really important uh, to us. It's kind of central to, to what we do, why we've, why we've built the company. Um, influence for me uh, is, has been something that's been baked into everything that I've done for, for a long period of time now. So um, I'm a psychologist and a behavioral columnist now, but I used to be a, uh, a, uh, I used to be a composer in, in theater. So if I share my screen now, just to, uh, just to prove that I'm, I'm not uh, telling uh, porky pies. This is a picture of me. Uh, that's me uh, with, uh, you know, looking a little bit younger than I am now, uh, conducting an orchestra for a short film that we were doing, recording here in Brisbane. Um, and the thing about uh, com composition and writing music, and uh, I did a lot of work in theatre, is that it's all about how do, you, how do you influence the person that's sitting in the chair? How do you change the feeling, the mood? How do you create that magic moment where people forget that they're sitting beside other people and just get locked into the story that's being told in front of them? And in theatre, even more so than, than, uh, than film, when you get that right, it's the most magical experience. So um, and a, lot of the, a lot of the things that we learn in theatre uh, that I learned in theatre actually carry across into what we're doing now with psychology and behavioural economics. So it's been something that's been with me for a very long time. But this is something about me that not a lot of people know. So I'm, I'm giving you a, a, a little bit more. I know that um, uh, there are a lot of people, uh, well, there, there are a few people here that were in the Brisbane session. Uh, and whilst I will be going over a little bit uh, of uh, sort of some background information that you would have seen in the Brisbane session, uh, where most of this is new content. So just so that you know, if you were in that Brisbane section, uh, don't tap out straight away. We are, we are we're going through some really, uh, really new and exciting content. Exciting for me anyway. So I feel like if it's exciting for me, it, it should be exciting for you. Um, I should, a word of warning before we go on though. As you would maybe have uh, drawn from the uh, title of this session, Going Ape Shit, I get excited every now and then. I may drop a few swear words. So if I swear in this session and you get offended by that, well, it sucks to be you, all right? But I'm sorry about that. It's, it's going to happen. But, but realize that it's, I'm not trying to be cool. It's, this is just the way that we, uh, we explain uh, a lot of uh, concepts and, and, and have some fun. So I'm hoping that through this session, we have some fun. Uh, I can share some stories, uh, put some questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, I've got some people up here keeping an eye on the, on the Q&A as well. So if you ask a question that, that's relevant, um, then we can answer it as we go. If we have to wait till the end of the session, uh, we will have a designated Q&A session at the end of the session. Uh, we'll also be able to, uh, to um, answer those questions then. But have a look at it, keep an eye on it, like it. Um, like we said, we'll, we'll touch on the, the sessions that are, that are uh, the most likes is going to um, get a free ticket to the session that we're holding uh, later on in the month. So, Decider, why are we talking about this thing called behavioural economics? So, behavioural economics is a thing and I'm not quite sure how many, uh, or what, what your level of understanding of behavioural economics is. And so to help me, uh, pitch sort of the way that I'm talking to, to help me communicate better to you. Uh, we're going to do a short poll. And this poll, I'm going to ask you in your mind to pick a number between zero and 10, not at random, right? Uh, where 10 means that you're a PhD in behavioral economics. You, you're just about to publish a paper. You're, you're well respected in the field of behavioral. You know exactly what's going on with behavioral economics, right? That might not be everyone. So five is kind of actually, I've read a couple of books. You may have read this book here called Nudge. I've heard of the, the idea of cognitive bias, system one, system two. If I say system one and system two, you, you know what I'm talking about. That'd be about a five, all right? 
And if you are in the teams, I've heard the term before. You just made it up. Uh, I think it's complete bullshit, and uh, and you're just uh, saying it to make me feel silly. So that would be zero, five, kind of ten. Your PhD. So in your mind right now, think of a number between zero and ten where you personally uh, see yourself in terms of your understanding. Okay, got that number? Excellent. So now we're going to publish a poll. Here we are, the poll. So now vote. Whenever under votes, we've got about 160 people online, so I expect 160 answers. So voting now, zero to three, uh, you know, bordering on it's more bullshit and three being I've got a limited understanding of maybe heard the term, four to six, we should all be there. Okay, so everyone should have picked a number before then. So everyone should have voted. And I think we're going to see the results of that vote. Do we see the results of that? Do I have to vote myself? I'm probably a seven to 10, so let me vote. There we go. Um, I'm, well, we hope I'm a seven to 10, right? Otherwise we're all, we're all in trouble. Um, yeah, the publish, the, do we see the publish? Do I see the publishing of the, of the results? I can't actually see that, uh, but oh, there we go. Look at that. Look at that, 71%, zero to three. Excellent, this is very good for me. Um, and 3%, me being one of them, seven to 10. Good, excellent, so it basically means I can say whatever I want and uh, no one's gonna know the difference. Joking, of course, if you are one of those experts, please uh, make sure that you're active in those questions. I think the questions uh, are a really good way of not just uh, attesting to uh, people's level of knowledge, but also uh, help us um, uh, guide the conversation in a meaningful way. But a lot of you either think it's bullshit or have a very little bit of understanding. So let's start with what is behavioral economics? Is this really is the foundation of, uh, of, what we're, of what we're talking about. This is why we're talking about behavioral economics is because influence, and if you're wanting to influence someone, essentially you're talking about influencing their decision-making. And if you can influence their decision-making, you will therefore influence their behavior. It's this funny thing about uh, um, a cognitive dissonance where when people's, if people's already made a decision, they can kind of pretend to vacillate around it, but then they're likely to behave that way. And sometimes you can change their decision with their behavior, but this is what we're trying to influence. This is influence. If you can influence people, you can influence their attitudes and their perspectives and the decisions that they're gonna make. And in an organization, often it's about influencing for a particular decision that you know is right for your project or, or for what you think is gonna be best for the organization. So behavioral economics is the science of decision-making. So this is why it's so important, okay? So let's have a look at what behavioral economics is. I keep pressing the wrong button, that's not helpful. So behavioral economics. Behavioral economics, uh, basically a couple of guys back in the 70s had an epiphany and they realized that we're not uh, all rational actors. Between, uh, sort of before that point, everyone assumed that we made decisions that were in our best interest, right? But, but these two guys, these two psychologists at the time, realized that we don't make decisions that are in our best interests. And the way that we make decisions is that we process information in two different ways. And there's a reason that we process information in two different ways. But the, their observation was that we have a system one way of processing and a system two way of processing, all right? And they called it system one and system two because they're scientists. They didn't come from the theater, obviously, right? So we'll address that later. But anyway, so system one and system two, two very different ways of us processing information as, as humans. System one is very reactive. It reacts to situations, right? Something presents itself, uh, a line comes, you'll react. You might you know, go attack or retreat or play dead, but you react, right? It, it's not a lot of thought that goes into it. System two is responsive, it's thoughtful, it's slower it's considered it, it it takes the time to be able to take some thought the problem with system two is that it takes energy and we have this thing called cognitive capacity we have a cognitive capacity or what some of the scientists call bounded rationality we have bounds or guardrails uh, which our, our brain is able to think and once we or a bucket you could say and once we once we tip all of our energy out of the bucket we need to fill out the bucket again before, before we can tip it out again and there's so much information in the world, we can't possibly think about everything. Right now, you're not thinking about your chair or how you're sitting or the lighting or maybe what you had for dinner. Now that I've said that, you are, but you, you don't. You, you sort of don't take into account everything that's around you. You're just focusing on the things that are important. Your system two responds to things. System one is fast. It's intuitive. It's very emotional. And it's, a, it's almost like a machine that jumps to... 
years. We ride for a few years, but we get on and we sort of know. As soon as we actually think about riding a bike, we become terrible at riding a bike and we lose our balance, right? So system one reacts, it's fast. System two responds, it's rational, it's our planning, it's slower considered thought, it's our novel assessment. So what that means is that I, I'm new right now. Uh, I may be a little bit over the top, my, my hands come close to the, the screen, right? Um, it's novel, like you're, you're, you're engaging your frontal lobe, which means that we've basically got about 45 minutes before you switch off, which is why 45 minutes is a great uh, time period for a seminar like this, right? I can never remember what system one and system two is. So I actually call system one our ape. And the reason we call it our ape is because system one is linked to the parts of the brain that first get developed when we're in the womb. So as babies, we develop these core systems, our fight or flight response, the amygdala, the hippocampus, which, which helps us store our memories, right? And it makes sense because as, as babies, we need to store memories and learn things about the world around us. So ingeniously in the womb, we create all these system one things that allow us to, to navigate the world around us. It's also, they're also parts of the brain that are most reflected in our, our nearest evolutionary cousins, the chimpanzees, right? So if we look at a chimpanzee's brains, they have these things, emotional reactivity and hippocampus. What they don't have is system two. So that's why we call system one our ape. It's our reactive ape. And that's why I like to say, when our ape runs the show, we go ape shit. So we under, we're going we're gonna to have a look at what going ape shit actually looks like. But this is our system one. For me, system two is you. This is actually you at your best. This is you thriving. This is when your emotions and your activity isn't uh, taking control. Now, while system one and our reactivity has a massive influence over our actual decisions, uh, and we'll have a look at that, our system two is often what we, what we are when we're thriving. And this is the place that we want to keep people in, particularly influencers and stakeholders at work. And when you're influencing people, when you're talking to people, often the, the biggest mind blow is just having people understand, am I talking to someone's ape or am I talking to them? You know, are they, are they controlled or are they triggered? And, and we get triggered all the time, right? So you might be in a meeting uh, and you, you get triggered and all of a sudden your ape comes out and you're reactive and you're making reactive decisions all the time uh, and you, you've lost the ability to, to control your ape, okay? So we're gonna have a look at our ape and you and we've got a few uh, cool little experiments to, uh, to, to, so that you know what your ape feels like because we find that we can talk about it and this is a great theory, but unless you can actually feel your ape, unless you can actually feel the disjoint between your information processing systems, it doesn't really work. So we're about to go into a few exercises and I really encourage you, when we do this live, it's easy because everyone's doing it as a group and, and we have a bit of fun. At home, I have no idea if you're doing it or not. You could be going, uh, making a cup of tea, you could just be uh, looking at the, the webinar and, and, and watching Avengers for all I know, right? But I really encourage you to get the most out of this, do these activities, they're a lot of fun. This is how we see our ape most of the time, right? This is how we, we like our ape, our reactive self. We think most people when they see our ape likes this. The problem is when it comes out, it usually looks like this. Uh, this is not helpful, okay? What does our ape look like? Actually, before we go into that, this is a bit of, a bit of new content. Um, this is a great thing. And if you have never heard of the hand brain, uh, I'm going to flick through it. A lot of kids in school actually learn this as a great way of understanding their emotional reactivity or their ape reactivity. So I'm going to do this in the, in the camera a little bit as well. So if you think of your hand and you fold your thumb over your hand, your thumb or your arm here is, is your, like, your central nervous system, is your backbone, right? Uh, and your central nervous system, your, your, uh, all the connectivities uh, in your backbone go up into the center of your brain up here. And so if you think about your, your thumb, it kind of represents the center of your brain. It also represents the parts of the brain that, that you uh, learn automatic behaviors or quite conveniently, as we term it, rules of thumb. So this is where your rules of thumb and your emotional reactivity sits. This is your system one. This is your ape, right? Now, system two is everything that folds across the top of it. So this is at the front of your brain uh, where your, uh, your cerebral cortex and your prefrontal cortex uh, sit within your brain. And this is where your uh, inhibition lies. This is your ability to plan, your ability to control your actions, your ability to see into the future. So in uh, psychological studies where they've been 
to this they can't budget, they can't finance, they lose their ability to control their aid, right? Because they have nothing that's controlling their, their, uh, their reactive system. So you might think with your reactive system, uh, often we talk about it in terms of flipping your lid or you're triggered or you flip out or you lose your head. And this is basically all this system too, it gets tired or somebody says something to you which really triggers you and you flip your lid and your ape is just running wild, going ape shit everywhere, right? This is not a good thing, right? So, so the point of behavioral economics is to, is to look at what these ape behaviors are, look at these rules of thumb and see where they're misapplied. But this whole hand brain is a really nice way of understanding how your brain works and, and understands information, right? So this is you in control, this is you flipping your lid. This is you at the start of the day when you wake up and you wanna exercise or you wanna, you go, yeah, I'm gonna to stick to my diet because I'm gonna lose weight. At the end of the day, you're a bit tired. And so all of a sudden your, your lid flips and it's like, oh my God, okay, let's, uh, let's have that glass of wine. And let's open the fridge and there's some chocolate cake. I, I, I can't control myself, I'm gonna eat some chocolate cake, all right? This is, this is why this happens at the end of the day. This is why we say, if you're gonna diet, don't have it in the house because at the end of the day, you won't be able to resist, okay? This is the hand brain. Now, interestingly enough, when we look at rules of thumb, okay, so let's park emotional reactivity for a moment and we look at rules of thumb. What does a rule of thumb actually look like? Well, this is a story of myself and my brother. So this photo is, uh, I'm there in the middle in the, in the red singlet. Uh, sandals are gonna come back one day, I promise you. Uh, and this is my older brother. And we went to school for years. Uh, we lived in a, a, a central New South Wales in a little town called Parks. Uh, if you've seen the movie, The Dish, uh, that's set in parks, right? We were on a wheat and sheep farm. We moved into town. And when we moved into town to go get closer to school, we had to cross the Parks Orange Road. Now, the Parks Orange Road had heaps of B-doubles and trucks down it. But our mum, you know, back then, she didn't, you know, drop us at school. She actually, uh, she just taught us rules to, to make sure that we didn't get squished as we crossed the road. So what did she do? She said, make sure when you get to this road, it's a dangerous road. Hold your brother's hand. Look right, look left, look right, look left. Make sure there's no cars coming. And when it's safe, you cross the road together. This is a great rule. We did this, we got to school safe, we walked home, we thought it was fantastic. After a while though, our ape learnt this rule. This is rule of thumb, it became a rule and we didn't even think about it. But then our ape learnt a different rule, a shorter rule. And our ape loves to conserve cognitive energy, right? So the new rule that our ape learnt was look right, there's no cars coming, step out onto the road a little bit, maybe a couple of steps, casually look left as we're going to school, there's no other cars coming, and we cross the road and we're safe because we step out and there's no cars, right? There's a car left, we just stop there and then we cross the road. So a new rule, and by that stage, I wasn't holding my brother's hand anyway, the new rule was just look right, step out in the road and cross the road safely, right? This was great, it's a new rule, everyone's winning. Rule of thumb keeps me safe. The problem was is that I won a competition when I was 17 and part of that competition, I flew to uh, LA and I you know, was super excited. I launched off the plane uh, and, uh, and, and ran out onto the road going, I'm gonna change my life, this is gonna be awesome. Went out onto the road right outside the airport, looked right, there was nothing coming and almost got taken out by a bus on my left. True story. I almost the first thing I was in uh, America, the bus driver had a slightly different opinion, a slightly different view, right? I uh, got out, this is my, my, um, my first uh, impressions of America, not that great. The point of this is, is that I applied a rule of thumb, how to cross the road safely in a different context and it almost got me killed. So rules of thumb work and we build them up because they keep us safe. The problem is that we apply those rules in different contexts and we get ourselves into trouble. So this is cognitive bias. These rules of thumb are our bias, our bias to do things, the cognitive bias that leads us to certain decisions. And that cognitive bias in the wrong context, without expertise, or without knowledge, can lead us to all sorts of poor decisions. So this is the study of behavioral economics. So let's have a look and see if we've got cognitive bias. Because everyone goes, yeah, this is great. I understand you, Phil. I'm right with you. Not for me. Everyone else has got a problem. I don't have a problem. So we're gonna have a, we're gonna do a few exercises here. So I encourage everyone to try this at home. Okay, I'm not gonna ask you to put it in the comments, okay? But I just want you to think what is the first answer that comes to mind when you see this question? 
There we go. What do cows drink? Now, most of you would have said milk. But in reality, we know cows don't drink milk. Cows drink water. All right. We only think milk because our brain is, is wired to pattern match and wired to see patterns. And we see the word cow and we see the word drink. And cow and drink is most closely associated in our brain after years and years of training with milk. So we say, what do cows drink? Milk. And uh, we don't actually think about the context of the words to go, what do cows drink? Water. Okay, so you got that one. Okay, let's try another one. Oop, here we go. Most people say toast. What do you put in a toaster? Toast. No, that's what you take out of a toaster. You put bread in a toaster, right? This is the same thing again, right? I even, I even told you what it was and still you thought toast as soon as you, as soon as the first word came to mind. Okay, so this is your ape. This is what your ape does. The ape is really powerful. Uh, let's try another one, okay? This is a maths question, okay? So a bat and a ball cost $1.10, all right, together. A bat and a ball cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Three, two, one, go. How much does the ball cost? A bat and a ball costs $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, a lot of people intuitively say 10 cents, right? Wrong. That's not the answer. And people, <laughs> my, my business partner gets, gets almost angry at this most of the time, right? Because you go, oh, it's, it's a dollar more than the ball. No, because if you think about it, if the ball costs 10 cents, which is what we want to say, the bat has to cost one dollar more than the ball, which is a dollar ten. The ball, the ball, which equals a dollar twenty. So that's obviously incorrect because we know the bat and the ball cost a dollar ten. So the ball must cost five cents, and the, so the bat can cost a dollar five, a dollar more, and equal a dollar ten. But our brain doesn't see this, doesn't do this maths. It, it jumps to these conclusions. It's a it's a, a machine for jumping to conclusions, right? So this is interesting. But what if what if we can start to uh to make it fight because often our system one and system two have a fight with each other now when i do this live and those in brisbane would have would have done this uh this um uh experiment with me so we often do a stroop test to tell people this so i encourage you to do this at home i'm going to ask you to say something out loud so if you've got headphones on and the kids are watching tv don't worry about them okay just try this at home i promise It'll, it'll be good, okay? This is the experiment. So here we have a list of words. I just want you out loud very quickly to say this list from purple to orange as fast as you can. Ready, set, go. Okay, most people have finished. You haven't finished now, you weren't doing it fast enough. The, the idea here is speed. Okay, now we're just gonna do the same list again, but at this time, instead of saying the word, I want you to say the color, okay? So it'll be red, blue, green, etc. Okay, as fast as you can. Three, two, one, go. Okay, if there's anyone still doing it, I commend you, but I guarantee you that half of you have just gone, fuck this, oh, I don't know, okay, this is too hard, right? Most people don't even get to the end of the list. No one can hear me anyway. Why would I be doing this list? Why is this so hard? Or at least even if you did get to the end of the list, why is it harder? Well, it's because our brain, our ape has been trained to see the word purple and say purple. What I'm trying to say is say the word, say, see the word purple, but say red because it's the color. And your brain's going, and so you have to suppress your ape. You have to actually control your ape and go red, blue, green, yellow, green. And it gets harder because your ape's trying to bust out. Your ape's going, oh, I know what the word says. And by the time you get halfway down the list, they're going to fuck it. It's blue, purple, black, red, green, orange. All right, I'm, I'm saying the words again. This is ridiculous, okay? This, that tension that you feel is this tension between what you know you should do and what your ape wants to do. And your ape has absolutely, uh, 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 is absolutely more stronger, okay, than, your, than you think. And so it's driving these decisions. So getting your ape under control is one of the first rules of influence, right? You being a better influence and being a better influence on others. And we're more influenced by our environment than we realize. Like we think we've got everything under control, but not really, okay? Okay, 
you know, that, that we avoid loss. We avoid the pain of loss more than the opportunity. So if I'm going to take 50 bucks away from you or give you 50 bucks, the pain of losing $50 is greater than the pleasure of getting $50, $50 right? So the pain, the hurt of a loss is twice as strong. So in order for you to take a chance, like if I was going to flip a coin and say, hey, heads, you win 50, tails, I win 50, you're not going to take that, that chance because it hurts too much. Whereas if I say, hey, flip a coin, heads, I'll give you $100, tails, you give me 50, you go, oh, maybe I'll take that chance. And a lot of people take that chance. The interesting thing is when you lose this bet, um, so if I say $100, you know, heads, $100, I'll give you, tails, you give me 50 bucks. If all of a sudden you lose and you give me $50, I can actually flip this around and say, okay, now we're going to play again. You know, flip the coin again, tails, you know, I'll give you 100 bucks, heads, you give me 100 bucks you probably take that chance because you're actually trying to make up for the pain of the loss. This is a really interesting phenomenon. So most people know loss aversion, the first part, they don't know part B. So this is really interesting in your projects, right? Because when you, your project experiences a setback or when the company, you know, if you're in charge of a, a lot of business that has a setback, you've got to really check your loss aversion because you're more likely to be, um, uh, you're more likely to be um, uh, risk uh, take much more risk on once you've experienced a loss in order to make up for the loss that you've made. Um, business strategists have, have this problem all the time or CEOs where they, they lose, you know, one quarter, you know, millions of dollars and all of a sudden, okay, we're going to do something, uh, something really amazing. And, and then they, they put a big risk on, they lose even more. And then it just goes down. This is the gambler's fallacy. This is why the gambler's fallacy works. We've got a, a, a um, a uh, question I can see online about the sunk cost fallacy. This is a, this is a great one. Uh, sunk cost fallacy is the idea that the more you sink into a project, or to, whether it be time or resource, the more likely you just want to see it, even if the context changes. I often talk about uh, a, you know, uh, a hotel on Route 66 that was being built and took like five years to build back in the 60s. And they were halfway through building it and they decided to put a freeway through. But instead of moving the hotel and saying, okay, we're going to stop now and go and move over to, they said, no, Route 66. We're convinced that people are still going to go with the romance of Route 66. We're going to build our hotel. They, they were so invested in the area, in the relationships, so invested in the time that they'd spent, so invested in the money that they'd spent, that they then just wasted the rest of the money building something that was never going to work. And we see this all the time in our projects or, or, in, or what business wants to do because they because they don't take into account the context that shifts. Different things happen. And when context shifts, so should plans, irrespective of how much you've already put into those plans. Or shares, you start to see your shares taken. It's like, ah, oh, but I put so much money in, I've lost so much. Loss aversion and some cost fallacy sort of work and you just, you watch them die and die and die, right? It's brilliant in all, uh, in all sorts of terrible ways. Another uh, bias, and, and we won't go through the 360 different biases, I promise. And this is the last one I'm going to call out. This is information bias. So information bias is the idea that, that people trust you with more information, even if that information is irrelevant. So often you see, uh, you know, you're going in for a big presentation, you want to convince someone, often you can just slam down a big load of books and say, we've done a whole bunch of research whether that's research or not, and um, this is what we found. And people go, wow, I don't know what the research is, but this is what they found. They've done so much research, we must believe them. You become more believable with just volume of information. It's the most amazing thing. We do an experiment where uh, we do a recruitment experiment and we give people just irrelevant information. They're pretty confident. We give them a little bit more information. Their confidence level goes up. Still irrelevant information, but they just get more confident with more information. Uh, you go into a meeting and they go, mm, yes, I think, Go away, give me some more information, we'll come back to us. Now, often what that says is, I've already actually made up my mind, but, you know, let's give me some more information and I'll feel more confident in the decision that I'm already going to make anyway, right? This is information bias. Uh, and you need to ward against this for yourself, that you're not being susceptible or prone to your own information bias. So this is our eight. This is where our rules of thumb, this is how strong they can be in, in influencing our decisions over ourselves and how we can often leverage them for opportunity to, to um, influence others. But our environment, so let's now look at our environment. So another activity, activity time. Uh, all I want you to do in this activity, I'm about to show you another word. And that four letter word I'm about to show you has a letter missing. And I just want you to think about what is the actual. Okay. 
99.9 of you said so. No, I didn't tell you that, that that word I was going to show you had anything to do with washing your hands or the picture in the background. But because there is a picture in the background, you're primed. What I'm doing here is priming you for what the answer should be. And so you say so. It could have also been something else like soup, for instance, right? And when we join this experiment with people across time, uh, if we show the picture on the left there of the cheeses, most people say soup. They don't say soap, even though cheese is kind of a soap. But anyway, uh, technical point aside, they'll say soap. This is the importance of priming. And, and, and priming is a real key uh, factor in, in influence and decision making. Because often when you get to a meeting, people have already made up their minds. If they haven't, you're very unlikely to get a, a decision at the meeting. So being able to prime them, not just with information and talk beforehand, but also doing like really simple things like the pictures that are on the wall in the room or, or the, the conversation that you just have beforehand can prime them in order to help make the decision that, that you want to uh, make or think is the best decision. Uh, and it's a, it's a tool of influence, right? So we can use cognitive bias and rules of thumb to look at um, uh, avoiding pitfalls and maximizing opportunities. We've got an interesting question about intuition and where does intuition come into the picture? So there's a great story about firefighters in the late 90s. And uh, there's an there's old firefighter, uh, captain of the firefighter, had a young crew, right? And his job was to train the crew. And in New York, they got a call out to a, a building, uh, an old one of these old New York uh, buildings, three-story buildings that was on fire and people have been, they need to go in and see if everyone had been evacuated. So the fire chief, they're all, and you know, you imagine these young fire, they they don't haven't had a fire for months and they're amped, like they're ready to go, they've been training, this is their moment, right? They burst through the door, their axes in hand, you know, helmets on, that they're ready to fight this uh, fire and, and rescue some people and be heroes of the day. And as the, as the captain walked into the room, he stopped and he just sensed something was wrong. And he said, guys, and there's recording of this, um, guys, we got to get out. Let's get out now. And you can hear the, the young crew going, what, we're here, we're ready to go. And he goes, no, we're going now. Turn around and go. And so they turn around and go. This was just his instinct was all he could say. As soon as they left the building, the floor that they were standing on collapsed because the fire they didn't realise actually generated from the basement and it killed all of the foundations of the, of the building uh, that were wooden at the time and the whole building then collapsed. If they were seconds later, they would have been killed. Now, now, what happened was that there were, you know, stories and newspaper articles and people saying, you know, people across the other side of the world were praying for them. And, and maybe there was, a, there was relatives there that were whispering into the ears of the firefighters and all sorts of crazy notions came up. But a bunch of psychologists actually decided to look at this and looked at the, the decision-making process that sit behind this instinct. And what they found was that our brain, uh, through a bunch of tests that they then ran, as an amazing ability to remember things, even though we don't uh, bring it to uh, our sort of our recall. So it's not only our recall in our conscious state, but it's like our ape has a memory and it, brings, it draws upon this memory in ways that, that, that we don't even think about. It sort of bypasses our system two, our conscious system, and goes straight into our system one. And what they think happens is as you become an expert in something, what you're doing is you're bringing up a file of of you filing up hundreds and hundreds of different experiences that, uh, that, that, that build up a module of what it should look like. Now our brains evolutionary hates anything that's different, anything that's changed. And if, if all of a sudden you get a new experience after hundreds of experiences, which is a bit different, our ape goes, hang on, something's different here. I don't know what it is, I'm out. I don't, it's just different, danger, go. And so this is what was prompting this, this expert firefighter to go, we're out of here. It feels like instinct, but actually it's experience. And this is, the, this is the value of experience in teams. And we know this, right? As you become more experienced, your instinct sharpens, not because you've committed everything to your conscious memory, but you've committed so much to your unconscious memory. Your ape is actually working for you, right? So this is where instinct comes in. Fascinating stuff. Fortunately, I'm not talking about this today, so we're gonna keep moving on. What I do wanna talk about is start moving from not just our rules of thumb, but our reactivity. And so and the effect that our reactivity has on, on, our, on, on our, our decisions and our influence. So these are two of my science heroes, right? Ashwell and Terry, these two guys are legends of the science, uh, of the science world. These uh, guys met in the early eighties and they joined an experiment experiment. 
what they found was, was stunning. So they took a thousand Dunedin residents, and the reason they went to Dunedin was Dunedin at the time had, had a, an, was an amazing hot pot of cultural mixes, European, Asian, Islander, American, basically every culture around the world was represented in Dunedin. They also had an amazing array of socioeconomic status from really poor people to wealthy people and, and education, and they had some of the best education facilities in the world. So it was a perfect place to test a simple question. What, over time, what creates successful people? Can we see something, behaviours, psychology, something about people's physiology that's better able to predict a successful life? So back in the late 70s, they recruited uh, just over 1,000 people, 1,021 people. Um, and they uh, tracked them over time. So every year they would come back and track these people. And here you can see a photo of Terry um, taking some biological measures uh, and they took biological, physiological, they tracked their cultural, they tracked their IQ, they tracked everything that they could possibly track. And every year they came back and tracked the same people over time to see what differences they made. Now, a normal longitudinal study, which is what this is called, uh, has an attrition rate. So people sort of fall out of the study at about 30%. So you would have expected after two or three years that of the thousand people that started, there may be 700 people left. And, and by now, maybe they'd have 500 people. That'd be a good study. The Dunedin study still has 996 of the original participants in the study 45 years later. This is insane. The data set that they've got is incredible. These were the guys that made the link between smoking and lung cancer and made it real. Like this study has changed the way that we live. What's really interesting for us though, is that they were looking at what are the predictive factors? Is there anything that we can see in children that predicts success later in life or for anyone? And they thought, you know, maybe it's IQ. And, and think to yourself, what do you think predicts success later in life? Most people say IQ, level of education, maybe socioeconomic status. So they started rich, so they're more likely to be rich when they left. Maybe it's the group of kids that they were around uh, in, in primary school. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's the school that they went to. Maybe it was the chance of them meeting a significant other or men role mentor or something like that. None of that seemed to make sense. Language they spoke, culture that they came from, none of it. None of it made any relevant. There was no correlation at all between any of those factors and success. The only predictor of success that they have found was your ability to control your emotions. That's it. You can control your emotions. It doesn't matter what IQ, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter what level of education you've had. Just control your emotions and you're more likely to be successful in life. And so in a meeting, this is really interesting when you want to be influenced over time. Because if you go ape shit, if you lose your shit at something, someone triggers you and you just go off your hail, even if you're right, even if most of the people in the room think that you're right and go, yes, you're right in that moment and you feel good because you went ape shit and you got shit done and something happened because you went ape shit. In the next project, when those same people go, we're going to build a team to get stuff done, when they think of you, they're more likely to go, look, he was right, absolutely. But you know what? There's this other person, they get the same results, but they're less reactive and so maybe more predictable, more trustworthy. They're more likely to go with that person, right? So this is a fascinating uh, piece about reactivity and the impact that it has on your opportunity or your influence. This is something that this guy, Robert Rubin, so former US Treasury Secretary to Bush, the second Bush, he had this, this uh, theory about poverty uh, and the cycle of poverty and imprisonment in, in, uh, in the States. This is a, a screenshot from a TED uh, talk that he did uh, I think in San Diego, you, again, Google it. It's a great talk. It's about poverty. Um, but part of this uh, study, they had 27 prisoners that they were looking at. And they realized that these 27 prisoners were there because of some moment that they said they flipped their lid or that they were reacting or that they did something that, 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 that where they lost their ability to have more conscious thought. And so Robert said, look, how much, can we quantify that? How much reactivity time did you did put you in prison? And so they went through each of them and they realized that collectively with the four, uh, with the 27 prisoners, that there was four minutes, 15 seconds of collective reactive decision-making. So across 27 participants, that's less than 30 seconds a person had translated.
125 years, four minutes and 15 seconds of, of reactive decision making or flipping your lead or losing your shit, less than 30 seconds each for each individual, translating to 725 years of incarceration. That's lost life. Right, and in our in our meetings, like we can only see the the, the moment that we, when we do react, when we lose control, when we lose our shit, the 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 lost opportunity. That's kind of the only indicator that we have is kind of relative to to that prison experiment. It it shows you how important not losing your shit is, but it also shows you uh, in a meeting in a social context how important it is for other people not to lose their shit if you're wanting to have a good meeting and be influential. Um, so. We, we are about to launch. We're super excited about this. We, we were hoping that it was going to be ready for today, but it's not. Uh, things take a little bit more in tech, uh, technological land and development land than, than one would hope. But in about a month, um, we can send this out. We've got an app. And this app is, going to, is helping you, give you the tools to control not only your own reactivity, but your other people's reactivity. It's a switch app. It helps you switch your mindset from one to the other, from your reactive self to your responsive self. It's going to be a fantastic app when it comes out. So we've been talking about your ape. And remember, behavioral economics is a little bit about your ape and about you. Now, your ape, we can go from this point, we can kind of go deeper into your ape. But we're not going to do that because how you control your ape uh, and how you communicate when people are going ape shit is a skill all into itself. And we're not going to do it justice here. So this is why we've got a follow-up webinar um, that we're going to uh, host in about uh, two or three weeks' time uh the two weeks time um and in that webinar we're going to deep dive into the ape so this is not just about how you control your ape and how you help control others apes but apes have sort of tribes and ways of thinking almost like different personalities or different worldviews see things in slightly different ways so you'll say one word and another ape will, will hear it in another way that's the purpose of that webinar so this is really important because what we're going to talk to now is more about you when you're at your best so there's a way to influence people when they're actually responding. So they're not going ape shit. We've been able to control apes. And this is what you do. Once all the apes are controlled and no one's going ape shit, this is how you influence people in an amazing way to make sure that you don't trigger people's apes. Because when you trigger people's apes, they're not really in a good influencing sort of mood. Unless, of course, you're into marketing and you want to trigger people's apes because you want to buy expensive diamonds or, or cars or coffee or cake, right? That, that's all ape behavior, right? So marketers love talking to apes. Um, you know, elections, politicians love talking to apes, you know, because it influences our decisions. But often when we're in organizations, once we get everyone's ape down together, it's actually us in our thriving state. This is where we are at our best. This is what we're going to talk about. Apes, I encourage you to really, uh, so this is the, the fly that we, you will be sent out after this session, but there is a, there is a, a, a link there uh, for Webinar Jam. So Webinar Jam is just our, uh, like Zoom, we're doing this over Zoom, Webinar Jam is a way of doing this. Uh, take a note of that link. It will be sent out later, but I'll forgive you if you momentarily open up another window and actually go and register now because controlling your ape is really, really important. If you can't control your ape or your reactivity or you can't control the apes of others, uh, a lot of what we're going through becomes a little bit redundant, okay? Because you've got to, uh, what we're about to talk about is how do you have difficult conversations or, or help influence people without triggering their ape, all right? So it's a very different conversation. So we're pivoting at this point. Uh, in Brisbane, we went down sort of the more ape road. We're going down the more you road now, all right? So uh, I can't uh, reiterate how important that is, right? So that's it. Don't forget, this is my little key marker to go, how much time we got? We're good, we're on time, this is great. But it also means that the question, so if you uh, put a question in the Q&A, the most liked question will get a free ticket to said webinar. So uh, that webinar, as you can see, uh, it's usually about $65. Uh, that's uh, for people that are non iab members that are gonna come along, that's what they'll be paying. IAB member, you'll only pay 30 bucks as a follow-up to this session. Uh, as, and uh, as a part of being, as a, a sort of a special for being a, an IAB member as well. So most like question gets that ticket for, for free. So you, this is you. So we're now going to put our ape to the side a little bit. Okay. So this is not your reaction. This is not you going ape shit. This is not you going far out, right? As I said, far out. I was about to say something else, but I didn't. So anyway, this is you. Now there is a, this is you and your this is you frontal lobe 
you when you're solving problems, right? There, there is a way that we see logic. There is a way that you can order information in order to align with the way that the brain works. And this has come from, from years of psychological study and psychological theory. Uh, and we've, we've put this into practice time and time again, but it does come from theory, right? This comes from science. The interesting thing for me is I read a book by, uh, uh, by uh, Chris Voss called Never Split the Difference. If you haven't read that book, it's a great book, all right? Never Split the Difference, it's about negotiation. He's an old FBI agent, right? And I thought this would be really interesting. Because if there's a way of processing information to influence, surely that would be reflected in that way that, behave, uh, that the FBI now works, uh, you know, building up over experience over, over years and years and years. And indeed, reading this book, I realized that's exactly what happens. FBI have this thing called a behavior change stairway model. And when you look at that, uh, that model, it, pr it, it, it reflects almost exactly what science and what theory and what management and consulting is, has talked about influence. So we're actually going to track both models at the same time so that you can see that this is a real thing. In the FBI, right, they've got a hostage uh, taken. They go there and there's a bank, you know, you, we've all seen the movies, you know, there are hostages there, they're masked, they've got guns. If they, you know, if the hostage goes wrong, people die, right? They, they, they can't make, they can't have this go wrong. But they've also often got to negotiate an outcome that the hostage takers don't don't want, right? The hostage taker want you know, $10 million in a helicopter and you've got to see if they re want to release all of their hostages without getting any of that and just walk out and voluntarily give themselves up. This is, how do they do that, right? So this is how they do that. I'm about to give you the keys to communicating, right? So uh, APSI is the, is the model. So have a look at APSI. So you can see there, APSI is actually an acronym for four stages, activate, partner, strategize, and implement, all right? Activate, partner, strategize, and implement. Now, as I imagine we've got a lot of project managers, program managers, business analysts on, online. To, uh, and, and one of the big problems that we see uh, with people that, that um, are in the detail when they're trying to influence is they go straight to the detail, straight to the implementation. What are we doing and where do we go? And the problem is, is that often people that aren't involved in the project the leaders, they don't get there. They, they're not there yet. And they just go, well, I don't understand this. What, what the hell? And they start just picking at things. And all of a sudden you've lost the meeting, right? So don't start with the detail. That is the last thing that you do. The first thing that you need to do, whoop, we're going backwards. This is exciting. The first thing we need to do and understand is that we need to start somewhere. So that green uh, arrow is where we start. APSI, activate. The other thing we need to do is to realize that even though we're in our rational mind, our apes are always there. It's apes that allow us, uh, to, that lower the drawbridge, that allow us the permission to go to the next stage. So if you're having a difficult conversation with someone, maybe someone uh, is gonna be remunerated or they expect a bonus that they're not gonna get, okay? So this is a difficult conversation and you don't want them to go apeship, right? You're trying to keep them. They're a valued employee. You don't, uh, you're a valued member of the project team uh, or you're wanting to tell a, a senior stakeholder that they can't have what they actually asked for. Right? This is a really difficult conversation because you don't want to be seen as just a naysayer or, or no, I can't do that, right? You want to be, yes, I can, but actually you can't. So how do you have that conversation? This is the way that you do it, but you've got to realize that apes lower the drawbridge. So we're going to go through this and I'm going to give you the things to listen out for uh, so that you know that you're allowed to go to the next stage. So where are we starting? The brain works in questions. So the very first question that most people are asking is why should anyone listen to you? Why should I listen to you right now? All right. If you're in an email, often this is the email header. Uh, people often say to me that they send out an email and they say, did you read the email? And they go, and people go, no, oh, I saw the email and I started reading it, but it didn't seem relevant. So I didn't keep reading. That's because you haven't activated their interest. They haven't asked the key question. You need to read the, I'm sending this email to you right now because your particular role is going to be affected by things that happen or, or your expertise is needed and all the input, like you need to set the context. In a conversation, you can say for the remuneration one, uh, you can say, look, we need to have a chat now because uh, the decisions that we make are, are going to affect the bonus, right? Okay, I'm activated, I'm in. Um, but the, it's not just about activating their interests. You need to be able to make sure that you, you've activated their, their listing capability. So they're listing. 
uh, active, um, activate, uh, active listening, you know, so active listening is the idea that you ask questions that, that uh, allow people to participate in an active way. So you might say, uh, look, we know that, the bonus, that this year hasn't been a strong year. Our bonus structures are, uh, are not going to be what they were in the past years. Uh, and I know that that often feels really crazy because, you know, um, people don't feel valued and we really do value. How, how does that make you feel? So this is, I'm asking a question that's inspiring an answer. It's not a yes, no answer. And uh, active listening, there's a couple of tricks that you can do, right? So a trick if somebody's uh, talking and they say, yeah, I know, it's actually, I heard from Bob that, that this is going to be really difficult. All they've done is they've said a statement. If I then repeat that really difficult, they go, yeah, yeah, I know, like it's, it's hard for the, blah, blah. and they, they, what that says is that I've actively listened to you. And just by re repeating the last two or three words of somebody's sentence actually says, I'm actively listening to you. And, and you're starting to, to activate that interest and that, 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 that connection with people. Once they emit any sort of emotion, so when they go, yeah, because, you know, I just, it sort of sucks. Like, I can't, I can't believe that, that the bonuses aren't coming through after all the hard work to do. It's just disappointing that, 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 that things are things. As soon as there's any sort of emotional leakage from the person that you're talking to, that's the drawbridge. That's the ape going, okay, we're okay. We're ready to go now to, are you with me or against me? This is the next question. So I go, I know, okay, I know I need to listen to you now, but are you with me or are you against me? Are you partnering with me or are you friend or foe? All right, are you with me on my side? So this is all about partnering. And the way that you partner is to, you tell stories about, yeah, back when I, bonus structures were cut from me when I was in your position and it really sucked. You know, you're partnering. Tell story, use humor where it's appropriate. Um, telling somebody they're gonna get a pay cut or fire probably isn't the, the right place to use humor, right? But, you know, this is a way that you can empathize with people and create empathy. Um, partners are great at making people laugh. Right? Um, they'll often do silly things or they'll, they'll, they'll come across a little orkies, but, but they're kind of cutesy and people go, oh, yeah, I'm laughing and you know, I kind of trust them. Right? That's, this is what people that are really good at partnering do. Um, and also labeling feelings. So often, often if you are not getting them to, to, feeling, you, uh, to, to say a feeling in order to lower the drawbridge, you can say, I know this might, does this feel frustrating to you? Or does this feel painful? And they go, yeah, I suppose it does. You, know, it do you can sort of draw it out. And so you want to label it for them. What, you know that you've partnered with them and, and, and you need to stay here for as long as they have, uh, you build empathy rapport. So, so in the behavioral change stairway model uh, on the inside of this graphic is that they, the FBI would do active listening and then they say, build empathy, build rapport, right? It's partnering. This is, this is exactly what they, they do. They'll sit in a room, they'll spend days sometimes just building rapport with it, not even talking about what they want to do or if the if everyone's safe or they'll, they'll get their story why are they doing this what's a, and and they need the they need the, the the terrorist or whoever it is the hostage taker to feel like that they've got empathy that they're now we're now working together on the problem so for um for a stakeholder that you're trying to influence it might be a senior uh, executive they if they don't think that you're trying to solve their problem then, then you just saying that we can't do what you're doing is not gonna, not gonna cut it. They need to know that the prob you're there to help them solve their problem. We just can't do it in the way that they think that they, they might be able to do it. Um, but the problem still exists and you understand that. Their apes not gonna get triggered and they go, okay, cool, we're solving the problem that's, that's at hand here. As soon as you hear anyone say or admit, yeah, that's it, yeah, you've got it. That's the problem that we're trying to solve, right? We, uh, yeah, yes, that's it then you go, cool, you don't need to hang around in partner land anymore, move on, all right? This is where we go to the strategy and uh, the strategizer, right? The strategy section, which is how is this gonna work? Now, again, this is not the detail. People like to jump to the, I say, here's the project plan, this is what we're gonna do. Well, hang on, hang on, we haven't figured out how we're gonna solve the problem yet, right? So, so you need to go, okay, this is how it's gonna work. That's the question, overall, high level, how is this going to work? Well, actually, you know, in order for us to, to become profitable next year, which is the big problem that we need to solve as a company, we need to survive so that we've got a profit. We need to we need to make sure that we've got some strategies in the place. And part of this is looking at a remuneration system. Uh, for the stakeholder, you need to say, so in order of the problem, we think that we can do that, solve that problem by going this different direction and by solving this problem and that problem. And what do you think about that? And, and all of a sudden, you're beside, you're standing beside because you've partnered, you're no longer presenting to that. 
and you're strategizing and, and and it's a together thing it's you no longer need to be in presentation mode you're in conversation mode you've got them you're part you're influencing them and this is uh, why the behavioral change model talks about this as influence because this is the moment that you're influencing their thoughts influencing their mind to align with the outcome that, that, that you're wanting to lead them to interesting enough sometimes you even come up with a better solution and which is great you know because this is this this often happens as soon as you see any sense of resignation so somebody just sort of sits back in their chair after their body language is that they go, yeah, all right, I get it. Yep, all right, so what do we need to do? You know, like, or, or they resonate, okay, so I'm not gonna get a bonus, okay, cool. What's, it, what's, the, what's the damage? What's it gonna hit? What are, what are we are gonna get? You know, this, this sense of resignation is, is, the, is the key, the drawbridge that finally you get to go to the detail, all right? Now is when the detail comes to the fore. Uh, and you get to talk about, um, this is the question. Now, if you, if you spend too long on strategy, people just get frustrated here. They're just going to go, what do I have to do? What are the details? So if you're in a, an all change thing, uh, you know, they go, okay, what does it look like? What's the new structure going to be? I realize that we need to do it. I get it. Uh, I realize you're all on the same side. I understand what, how, why this change is so important. Okay, so now what are the details? What are people going to do? What are the next steps? This is why at the end of a meeting, you often end with next steps. It's because, because naturally, this is where the brain goes. They want something to do. What are we going to walk away to pick? Um, I... I'm naturally very good at the activating and the strategizing part of the conversation. And so I used to make the mistake that I'd get them on board, I'd partner with them, I'd do the strategy and I wouldn't go into the detail. And then people just get frustrated because they go, you go to the next meeting and, and you find the next meeting, you're having to do all this again because you didn't quite get to the detail, right? So this is the thing. So if you don't follow this, this path, what happens if you activate their listening, but don't partner with them and just go straight to the implementation, the ape hasn't lowered the drawbridge, all right? And so the ape goes, right, I'm going ape shit. They haven't, and, and all of a sudden you're dealing with apes. And now you need to calm the ape down because the, 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 the senior stakeholder just goes, no, nah, no, nah, look, I, I think we just need to go with what we're gonna go with. Either you can do it or you can't do it. Tell me if you can do it, right? You, we all know what that feels like, right? Or the, or the employee just goes, oh, whatever, you don't care. And then you go, okay, meeting ended, that was a bit shit. And then the employee goes and creates all sorts of monk and everyone's going apes all of a sudden and takes a couple of, uh, of weeks to get over it. This is why the ripping the bandaid off approach is never a good approach, right? You've got to do things in the order that the brain, that the brain wants to, to think things in. So this is APSI, right? This is really important. The implementation is where you get the behavior change. This is where the doing, this is the, 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 the FBI do call this the behavior change stage. You're, you're implementing, you're, you're accessing the next steps. This is about what to do. APSI, activate, partner, strategize, then implement, all right? So again, this is all about when you're not in your reactive state. And, and, and uh, re there's another whole part to this story, which is when you, people go apeshit or when you're going apeshit. And that's what we're gonna do in that seminar. So make sure you come along that seminar because you'll get the rest of the, of the story in order to be able to influence. We're gonna have a look at all of this ape, the ape reacting. You can talk about different people, their tribes, and, and whether they're, they're more introspective or, or action oriented. And we'll go into all of this. This is really cool detail. So here's the slide. If you're gonna screenshot something to, to get a good uh, indication of what, uh, of what to do, this is, the, this is the screen to screenshot. Activate, listen for emotion, that's the bridge. Partner, yes, that's it, strategize, uh, if you listen for resignation and implement. And if you're doing an email, obviously email is a one-way conversation. You still structure the email in a way that makes sense. So this is absolutely, and we're gonna send this out to you as part of the email after this, so that you can start to practice seeing your written communications as well in order to uh, in order to write better emails and better communications. And sometimes these four steps are four sentences. You know, first half of the sentence is activate. It doesn't need to be long. Sometimes it's an essay. It really depends on, on what you're trying to do. But this works. We've tried it over and over again. And it's, uh, and, uh, and what, you know, we've never found this not to work. But the key is realize that you, you, when you're talking to apes, you need to talk to apes. When apes are settled down and you want to influence in a more strategic, influential way, APSI is the way to do it. APSI is the way to order the information in the way that the brain thinks. So these are our next steps. And before we go to a Q&A, next steps, we want you to go to decided.co. We want you to take the, the survey. This will really help uh, in our discussions for the, for the, uh, the webinar. That'll kind of give us an indication. 
and what you, what you what part of that process you kind of do best because people tend to do you know activate partner strategize or implement people will tend to do one of those elements better than another so this do the estimate survey uh that that'll give you that register for the webinar again there's the link again and then try the apps email template just give it a go uh, and see what the effect is and i've got a great story that i can't share with you uh right now but if it comes up in question time we might uh, of a really difficult situation where my own brother-in-law tried this in Queensland Health for a massive structural change. And a structural change that would have taken six weeks took six months, uh, sorry, other way around. A structural change that they thought would take six months ended up only taking six weeks and nobody left and nobody was upset. It really does work. So I think of that, with that, I'm gonna leave it on this slide. And I think we're gonna to go to a Q and A time. Naeem, are, are you online? Uh, have you got, um, uh, uh, having a look at some of the most liked questions. What do we got there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have quite a few questions and uh, may I request everyone to like the questions. Um, the, the questions that will get the highest like, we will only answer to those questions. There is uh, close to 50 questions sitting actually in the Q&A. So we won't be able to go through all of them. So we'll just go to the one that gets the most amount of like. And also wants to highlight that uh, in the chat window, we will post the link for the next two events. So if you want to join uh, the event we are having on 15th of July, uh, which is on uh, facilitating uh, in virtual environment and uh, the event on 29th of July, um, which will be focusing on um, the value creation, uh, please feel free to use those links and register yourself. So I'm just looking at the Q&A window. Uh, and oh my God, there's so many questions. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, question, I'm going a bit over time. That's my fault. No, it's all right. That got the highest like is actually from CW. And um, it's asked, how do you calm someone during a meeting when you can see they have switched to ape mode? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And, and something that we are going to deep dive in in the webinar. Um, so the, the, the short answer is that there are some uh, by understanding who you're talking to um, you can very quickly switch them out of their reactive state into their more responsive state but the, the worst thing you want to do is argue with an ape you can't argue with apes uh, apes you've got to realize that when apes are triggered there's no they're not thinking rationally they're thinking instinctively right and their instinct will feel so strong and so right that if you try to buck with them all, all, all that's going to happen is your apes going to come out and then apes are fighting with other apes and everyone else just goes, what the fuck's going on here? And no one, no one wins. But there are definitely uh, uh, tips and tricks to be able to influence someone else's ape. So if they're annoyed or if somebody said something, so you maybe you're the third person in the meeting and somebody said something, a, a good uh, example of this is to go, actually, that's a really good point. So recognizing their ape not diminishing their rate, recognizing their rate and going, that's a great point. I'm actually gonna put it up here on the wall and write it there so their rate realizes that they've been heard and go, we're gonna park this for the moment, but let's come back to that because I think that's really important. And if we've got time at the end, we can. So a lot of people call this a parking lot, right? Oh. So that, that, um, that parking lot uh, is, is a really, um, uh, one of the tricks in order to switch people's uh, mindsets. Uh, another thing you can do is to is to reframe the conversation so if they're, if they're making a correlation between well that's happened so it could be that and you can say quite simply yes it could also be this as well and there are four or five different ways that it could be and they sort of go oh yeah it could be that as well so maybe i'll, I'll back off so th there's a bunch of things that you can do but those are two techniques um the way we've got, we've got we will we go into a lot more techniques in the in the workshop but there are a couple i quite like the the question about um uh, influencing and manipulation as well that I can sort of see come up there. Uh, and this is something that does come up a lot. Uh, what's the difference or the line between influencing and manipulating? And realistically, the two sides of the same coin. Um, but influence, I always think, is when you've got a positive outcome, when you're doing it for altruistic means, when you're doing it for good, like everyone influences all the time. You influence your kids, you influence your relationships, you influence, you know, you go and sell something, you're influencing them to sell. We, we breathe and we communicate with people, we're influencing. You can't not influence, all right? So, so that's the first thing. Don't, no one can go around saying that they're, they're not trying to influence other people. It's not evil, it's just... 
we want to influence the other people that opinion. Manipulation is kind of like uh, more like um, uh, I'm manipulating you to an end that's not good, but for my own gain. It becomes a selfish gain. Manipulating is when it's for my gain. Influence is when it's for the greater good uh, for, for, for the company or for the organization. Uh, and to me, that's the difference. You know, people become political and manipulative when they sort of try to play politics in organizations in order to, to for their own personal gain. And politics often kills creativity. It, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. When you're influencing, you're actually doing it not just for you, like, yes, you win out of being a positive influencer, but you're actually doing it for the project or for the, for the good of the company or for the good of the person you're talking to, for the good of the outcome. An FBI agent is trying to influence a terrorist so that other people don't die, right? This is, this is about, this is not, in, this is not manipulation, this is influence. And so there, it's, it's, it's at the core, it's a, it, there's a different intent. Um, it's using the same neural mechanisms, it's using the same psychology, but it's the difference. Anyway, sorry, Naeem, uh, back to you. I hope, hopefully that's, that sort of answered the question. So, um, the next question is from Joel. And uh, the question is, how do you reconnect yourself if you have been uh, aping too much? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that, aping too much. When you go ape shit, uh, uh, the, the, this is the purpose of the switch app, right? That we're gonna, to, to, so that you can find different tools, different things that work for you. So when it comes to you, uh, something that works for me isn't going to work for you. For me, um, being around people that I love, uh, when I go apeshit, they can they realize that I go apeshit is, is a, it, it, it can, it can say, uh, Phil, you, you're reacting, not responding right now. And by, by even by saying that, I go, yes, actually, I'm reacting, not responding. Uh, I, I need to respond. How do I respond, not react? And me getting that that mental uh, language in my head, am I responding or reacting right now, is really important. But sometimes I'm reacting and I'm reacting too much and I need to pull back. Another way to do it uh, that a lot of people use is to just apologize in the moment, to say, sorry, I just reacted right then, which wasn't that helpful. Um, so in, in a meeting that can be really effective, you know, by, by at least calling it out and saying, okay, I'm not reacting now. Let, let's have a talk about this in a more responsive manner. Just using that allows everyone else to not feel manky and everyone to calm down and go, oh, okay, they realize that, that it's been reactive. There are other things you can do. Reframing uh, is a big one. For a lot of people that have got a lot of anxiety, and so sometimes going ape shit means you just get really anxious and you can't sleep and, and you, 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 you hype yourself up and, and anxiety is, is an ape reaction. Sometimes just that's because someone said something, you're making meaning of that, uh, that moment. And so reframing it says, well, what if they didn't mean that? What if they meant something else? What, what are other meanings that they're likely to have? And by doing that reframing, settles your ape down. It's the same thing that happens when people, somebody, some wanker cuts you off in traffic, right? And you, you go ape shit, right? Um, and, and in that moment going, actually that's a, yeah, that person probably trying to go to hospital. Maybe they got an emergency and maybe they're about to lose their job. Maybe they just had a, you know, like reframing their intention helps you actually calm yourself down. So they're all different type of switch techniques. Uh, and there's, there's literally hundreds of different switch techniques. And that, when the, the switch app comes out, we will be talking, as I said, in the workshop, but when the switch app comes out, um, the, the purpose of that app is to start practicing different switches uh, and, to, and to build a sort of a favorites list of things that really work for you and train your rules of thumb, because that's the important thing, right? When you're, when you're not going apeshit, that's when you train yourself to, to respond when you're in a situation when your ape wants to go ape, ape shit. That's why we're people in the army train so much because when they're under fire and they're under pressure and they're, they're acting on instinct, they kind of intuitively know what to do because they've had the time to train their ape. So that's, that's uh, if you're aping too much, that's, uh, that's some, some, some tricks, some tools. So, so Phil, uh, what about if someone else is aping in a meeting, how are we gonna manage them? Yes, excellent, that, uh, that often happens. Um, uh, and and controlling others, uh, I suppose one of the trick, uh, one of the tricks of controlling others is not to assume that the way that others, the way that way that you calm other people's apes isn't the same as the way that you calm yourself down. So some of that is a bit trial and error. So if you've got a colleague who's gone apeshit, sometimes you actually just need to go. Let's have a five minute break. Um, let's go get a cup of coffee and just break the meeting and come back. And you and that's enough in order for everyone to settle down. They get. 
you can have a more uh, conversation. That doesn't always work, right? For certain people that works. For other people, the parking lot is a really effective uh, tool to use in a meeting when you're running a meeting. But you're not always running a meeting, right? Sometimes sometimes it's your colleague that's going ape shit and you're like trying to calm them down because we're on, a, we're on a plan here, right? And so that can be as simple as saying, yes, I, I agree that and. So using the word yes and onto something rather than no but, is it just a simple little trick where you can go, I, uh, it's like, I, I see this, I see your your point of view. And I also think to add on to that, that this is really important. And what they then tend to do is go, yeah, you heard me, so I'm going to hear you as well. And you've sort of, that now, now it's a group, there's less reactivity. They don't feel like they're in a corner having to defend themselves out of a position. Because when people are defending themselves out of a position, what's really interesting is when you talk to them later, they go, I'm probably not as passionate about it as I, as I came across in the meeting, but for some reason I just felt attacked, like I needed to, to punch my way out. And so you give them a way out, be gracious and, and let them have a way out. These are all different tools and tricks of, of helping uh, other people in a meeting uh, calm their shit down. What you don't do is to, is to say, uh, I think we're all getting a bit heated now. I think it's about time that we just calm down, just calm the farm. No, no. When, when, did, when in the history of anything did that ever calm anything down? Don't say that. That's not what you do. That's, not, that's you saying to them, you're less intelligent. You, you don't have your shit together, but I'm better than you. And so I'm going to patronizingly say, calm down. You know, I mean, anyone that's married knows very early on that that is not a good technique to calm someone else down when they're going, ain't shit, right? So don't do that. It's about partnering, right? It's about, about going, we're with you. We're not against you. I, I hear you. I get you. I acknowledge you. Um, but there, the, the, again, the switch app and, and what we go through, uh, next week so there's there's three tribes that people psychologically sort of ascribe to knowing sort of and intuitively understanding what tribe they're in you'll know how best to manage their rapes to calm them down fantastic i think there's a lot of good tips and i'd really like to know that what are some of the things you have tried in your meetings i believe as a business analyst this is something we face all the time when we want mm. everyone to agree so please put mm. in the chat box so what are some of the things you have tried, some of the things that worked well, some of the things was, was quite interesting, had quite interesting outcome. Put it in, into the chat box and share with others. But those tips are really good. Um, we're gonna probably take two more, go through two more questions and then uh, finish the session. It's very cl close to 7.30. So I'm just wondering, um, so the question that, that from Kathy, um, she's asking, do I only have one ape in me? <laughs> that's a great question so neurologically speaking it probably doesn't uh define uh you know we've, we've slightly oversimpl uh, oversimplified the idea of triggering apes but but primarily the answer is is yes in, in a sense you have a a way that you've learned to react and the reason you only have one app uh, ape is because um you develop your ape and again don't really ape isn't the enemy your reactive self is in the enemy. Your reactive self and your rules of thumb that you built up over time are there to help you keep you safe, right? So your ape's job is there to, to protect you, right? It's not there to harm you. It just harms you unintentionally. Um, but the reason that we have an ape is because we've learned to, it's how we've learned to survive essentially up until, we're, uh, up until the age of 12 to 14. Puberty kind of is that, that crucial point that we see from a psychological perspective that most of the things that we've learned uh, when we hit puberty um, tend to become patterns of behavior for the rest of our life. It's not to say that they're not changeable, they're not immutable. It's just that they change a lot slower after that point. So often our reactivity is more linked to how we learn to survive in our family and our friends and our immediate relationships. So interestingly, when you're under pressure or you're feeling attacked, you almost react to them like you react to your brothers or sisters growing up or your, your friends uh, or the way that you navigated the schoolyard as a kid. Um, and it's and and so, because it's a survival mechanism, yeah, you you kind of tend to have have one ape or one one reactive system. But that ape is built up of many rules of thumb, hundreds of thousands of rules of thumb and instincts and emotions that get built up over time. Uh, if you've got two apes, that's another conversation we need to have. And I think that there's some drugs that we can give you for that. Uh, I can't remember what the, the drug is. It's a uh, but anyway, yes. Fantastic. And uh, the last question for the session, uh, as a leader forming a team, do you stay shy away from selecting those that you know have difficulty, um, difficulty containing their aid? 
So as a leader, um, you pick up the people in your team who has difficulty in containing their aid. Yeah, it's a really good question. A diversity in a team for me is more than just having people of different, um, uh, different genders or uh, 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 cultural backgrounds. I mean, that's important because it's it usually, if you have diversity of thought, you'll naturally have that. You'll naturally have a gender diversity and a cultural diversity if you're selecting on diversity of thought. One thing that I often say to leaders is making sure that, yes, you don't want highly reactive people in a team, but are they, are they highly reactive people or they're just highly reactive to you? You know, are you doing something that's causing them to be reactive? Because like I said, you know, we, we have tribes of schools of thought that we most connect to. And so sometimes we actually are doing the things that's, that, that are causing them to be reactive. So it's more complicated than a yes or no question. I would say that, that as humans, we tend to gravitate towards the people that are either most like us or that if they're not that like us, we will then gravitate towards the people that are less reactive. Um, so if they're reactive people, but they actually most agree with us, we're less likely to take reactivity into account. If, if they have a different worldview to us, then we're more likely to take that reactivity into account and sort of term it like, oh, they just weren't a good fit, you know, or something like that. Um, so it's a two way uh, interaction. Uh, I, I would suggest sometimes we can do things better in order to not have people be so reactive, but sometimes people are just so reactive and, and in a way people, there are some people that have learned to survive by being reactive. They actually get energy out of it. They get purpose and meaning in life out of it. And, and sometimes it's just that that's not a helpful um, person to sometimes have in a team. Um, and so you want people to be able to control their apes uh, or have the ability to control their apes and understand that everyone at some point goes a bit ape shit. I, I went ape shit earlier today. And the, the way that I went ape shit is I just, I had a moment of quietness to myself and I had to overcome it. So everyone goes ape shit. It's about how well you can control your ape. Uh, and it's a level of maturity thing as well. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, so uh, Phil do have some uh, resources uh, to share. So there's one particular slide you'd like to share, but I'll just uh, let him probably put that slide at the end. Uh, just uh, want uh, to yep. uh, bring your attention that uh, there's a follow-up event happening in mid-July. If you want to learn a little bit more about this topic, uh, feel free to join for that session. Mm. And uh, there's a special discount for the IB members. Uh, mm. And we're gonna send you the link uh, as part of uh, mm. uh, the thank you email and the survey we'll send you. So please uh, feel free to complete the survey. It will also have the slides for the session. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, just uh, want to bring your attention for the, the two events. Um, I believe uh, our events team already put those links on the chat box. So please register for the, for the events uh, that we are having later this month. And also go to our website and uh, you'll find the same links. Uh, so please uh, feel free to join. Uh, I also want to thank you who worked really hard uh, in uh, organizing this session. So of course we're working with Phil for the last couple of months uh, and, and, her, and his colleague Rochelle. Uh, we work very closely with her actually uh, to organize this session. And uh, Rochelle is actually sitting just next to Phil. She, she's sitting beside <laughs> me here. There, there she is, there's Rochelle. <laughs> Other than that, I uh, also want to thank uh, our directors, actually, Carl from Wagga, Gary from Canberra, Suzanne Tamo from Sydney, who actually helped us uh, to organize a lot of the backend things for this event. Also want to acknowledge uh, all the event managers across Australia, especially mm -hmm. Anne-Marie from Adelaide, uh, Sarita from Sydney and uh, our marketing manager in Sydney, uh, Celine, um, and also Rani. So we all worked together, together with other volunteers to showcase uh, this event. Uh, idea is it? Naeem, I, I gotta say before, you sound like you're about to fall, and we haven't actually identified the winner of our, of our competition, the most liked question. And I think you've got the master list there. Who's our most liked question? Is it, is it CW? So, Do we have the right person here? Yes, it's CW. And uh, if I could please ask CW to put your name on the chat box so we know who, what your full name is uh, and your email address. So we'll reach out to you. So the Brilliant. question for, from CW got 26 likes. So that's the highest liked question. 
And uh, yes, uh, so we are a volunteer run uh, event. And um, this is for me, this is the first time I'm actually doing a virtual event. So my hand were closed all the time. So I have to just control <laughs> my head and say, OK, let's open it and feel relaxed. Um, so very excited, actually, uh, to learn from you, Phil. And uh, thank you. And thank you, everyone, who actually helped us to organize this event. But don't leave yet, because there's one more slide uh, Phil would like to share, which are some resources that you may like to uh, go through if you are more interested about this event. Um, so Phil, if you could please share your screen again. Uh, yes, we can do that. And uh, I'll sign off here and uh, let Phil uh, actually oh, do say the closing notes. And uh, thank you so much, Phil. Thank you, Rochelle, uh, uh, for working with us uh, to facilitate this session. Uh, so I'll sign off and to you, Phil. Great, thanks, Naeem. Yeah, look, just um, that's that, that's the link. Uh, we do have slight uh, some limitations around the number of people in there. So if you if you're really interested in in and uh, some really good tips and tricks for the uh, controlling your rate, get onto that. Do do it do it sooner than later. Um, register for the event. It's only in two weeks' time. Uh, everyone but uh, CW ha only has to pay thirty bucks, not not the uh, not the uh, the sixty five that usually is. Uh, I guarantee you that, that we'll have a great time. There'll be heaps of Q&A time in that session. So we'll do a 90 minute session and then we just stay around to have a good chat for at least half an hour or so uh, to make sure that we really embed uh, some good treat and you walk away from that with something that's uh, really tangible and that, that you can uh, be a better influence from the moment that you leave that, that webinar. That's really our, our, our objective. So uh, do the survey, register for the event, uh, try out the APSI email template that you'll be sent out uh, soon. Really appreciate you logging on. Uh, we love doing this. This really energizes us. Uh, for us, the, the, more, uh, the more people that can be better influencers and, make, and be making better decisions, the better the world will be. Thank you so much. Uh, this is us signing out from now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.